and library mark an important milestone in the development of the history of science in Argentina. In 1939, he was appointed director of the Institute of History and Philosophy of Science, created the previous year at the Universidad Nacional del Litoral in the city of Santa Fe. There, Mieli published several issues of Archeion until 1943, when the university lost its autonomy and the military government appointed an auditor who suppressed the institute. This is a very good example of the kind of political and institutional instability that has been characteristic of Argentina. Miele's presence in the country made it possible for some Argentines to take a more serious interest in the history of science and for the mathematician Jose Babini to be trained as a professional historian of science. Another important historian of science at that time was the Hungarian Desiderio Papp, who emigrated to Argentina in 1942. He was appointed professor of the history of science at the Faculty of Pure and Applied Sciences and the Faculty of Philosophy and Letters of the National University of Tucumán in 1945. That tradition was hardly preserved because of the political vicissitudes that Argentina has suffered. In fact, it can be said that the history of science in Argentina has often been done in spite of, rather than thanks to, political and economic conditions. However, the history of science, after a long period of academic ostracism and the recovery of democracy 40 years ago, is beginning to show signs of a possible retrieval. The history of science is currently taught in several universities, usually as a graduate course. For instance, in some faculty from the University of Buenos Aires, and more recently in the Creative National Universities in the greater Buenos Aires area, San Martin, Quilmes, 3 de Febrero, Lanús, that have chairs in history of, of science, usually associated with graduate programs in science policy, sociology of science, and philosophy of science. In general, there are multiple and plural ways of doing research in the history of science. Among others, the following types of history of science can be mentioned. Biographical, autobiographical, prosopographical, fictional, thematic, institutional, national, disciplinary, comparative, hypothetical, anachronic, diachronic, experimental, scientometrical, and conceptual. And some of them, if not all, have been practiced or are being practiced by historians of science in Argentina at one time or another. But if we uh, focus on a conceptual, intellectual, theoretical, philosophical history of science, it can be said that one way to do this kind of research is to make some connection to the philosophy of science. This is a continuation of a long tradition already present in the main authors of the 19th and early 20th, 20th centuries such as William Hull, Ernst Mach, and Pierre Duhem, who maintained that there was a close relationship between the two in the sense that they understood their philosophical positions were based on reflections made in the history of science. And in order to carry out historical analysis of science, one had to possess some philosophical concept of science. A similar position was sustained by Emil Meyerson and his circle, which included Alexander Coiré, Leon Brunswick, and Helen Metzger, and of uh, Edouard Leroy, 
Ernst Kassiran, Edgar Zilsen, Ludwig Fleck, Abel Rey, Gaston Bachelard, and Georges Ganguilhem, among others, towards the mid 20th century. At the same time, however, some philosophers of science, including Hanson, Mary Hess, and Tulmin, acknowledge the relevance of history of science for philosophical reflection on science, giving rise to what would become known as the historical term, term which was continued in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s by Kuhn, Feyerabend, Lakatos, and Larry Loudon. The work of these historicist philosophers of science, as well as the attempts of other more formalist authors, such as Joseph Smith, Wolfgang Steckmüller, and Ulysses Mulines, along with the popularization of the paraphrasing of Kant's dictum, contributed to rethink the relationship between the philosophy of science and the history of science. This dictum was first formulated in two sentences by Hanson and then put together in one single sentence by Lakatos. And I quote, philosophy of science without history of science is empty. History of science without philosophy of science is blind. The discussion of such relationships continued with the questioning of the link developed between the two metascientific subdisciplines, whether it was not more a marriage of convenience than an intimate relationship. Also, the adoption of the naturalist, uh, naturalistic turn and the proposal of the so called confrontation model, and more recently, the development of the new historical epistemology and the so-called integrated history and philosophy of science. Linked to these different authors and positions, as well as to those in the philosophy of history, such as the dispute of historicism in Germany since the second half of the 19th century, an approach is grounded in conceptual and intellectual history. In Argentina, we find Historic, historically minded philosophers of science and philosophically minded historians of science. The country is characterized by diverse and pluralistic forms of research that relate the philosophy of science to the history of science, whether or not Argentine science itself is the object of study. These approaches range on a continuum from those that erroneously do not seem to be linked or relevant to the history of science, to those that also erroneously seem unrelated to philosophy in general and of science in particular. This continuum begins at one extreme with synchronic philosophical analysis of episodes in the history of science, moves through diachronic philosophical analysis and historical epistemological analysis and ends at the other extreme with conceptual analysis of episodes in the history of science. Synchrony and diachrony represent two sides of the same coin. Every synchronic analysis presupposes eruption within temporal becoming. And every diachronic analysis presupposes synchronic analysis of successive events in time. Even synchronic philosophical analyses are based on history, namely on what the philosopher might consider the best history available, even though they might be incorrect or later revise their decision. Given the inextricable link between synchrony, diachrony, and history, it is not only true that diachronic philosophical analysis of science can contribute to a better understanding of the history of science. Synchronic philosophical analysis can also shed light on some historiographical problems raised on the history of science. On the other hand, every historiographic narrative 
has theoretical presuppositions, even if it claims to be merely descriptive or consists of the narrative criticized by Kuhn of a repository of anecdotes or chronology and of which historians may or may not be aware. I would like to conclude my participation with the following observations. On the one hand, the work done in the history of science can contribute not only to the field itself, but also to teaching, education, and communication of science, and to science policy and management. It may even contribute to the development of a socially sensitive and ethically responsible scientific community and society. On the other hand, we all know the difficulty of prediction in any complex dynamical system that is sensitive to changes in initial conditions at the Argentine society in which the history of science develops is such a system. However, if Argentina had the stability and continuity that it has largely lacked, and if historians of science receive economic and institutional support, the history of science could endure and grow in many different ways. Let's hope so. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus, you still with us? Okay. I think I think we've temporarily lost Marcus. So I'll step in <laughs> for a second to chair as Thomas comes up. There we go. Okay. Thomas, do you want to carry on? Or Marcus, we got you back. You're muted, Marcus. Tim, would you like to continue? Yeah. Okay, let me share uh, my screen. Okay. Um, uh, nice to meet you all. And, uh, you know, uh, we are all in different time zone, but uh, so thank you for uh, sharing your time to be here. And uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to uh, to contribute to this event as a, 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 I mean representing South Korea and also Jeonbuk National University where I'm working for so uh, because time uh, we have very limited time let me just jump into the uh, my uh, presentation so uh, basically what I'm talking about is uh, how uh, South Korean scholars in the history of STM uh, uh, think about the, the challenges uh, to themselves and uh, how they try to uh, answer to and respond to those challenges. So um, let me uh, directly begin with the, the uh, famous Joseph Needham. So um, we all know that actually, uh, we all know that the, the history of science has uh, it kind of con was conceived in the Western context and the history of uh, science and technology, science, technology and medicine had been uh, largely written from the Western perspectives. And, but um, it was Joseph Needham who, who published the science and civilization in China in the late, in, in the 1950s and uh, reminded us that the, there, there were other traditions in science, uh, technology and medicine. And he even claimed that, that the science we see today, the modern science uh, should be uh, rather uh, should be called ecumenical science rather than Western science because all are, all the civilization in the world contributed to 
the science uh, we we um, we are living in today. So and and accordingly, so subsequently, a whole new field of the East Asian history of STM emerged, and uh, I was also educated within that tradition. So uh, it was a quite a big uh, development, historiographically speaking, but. Uh, still there, there are some uh, questions remaining so then what about the within the context of east asia so uh i mean at, at the first phase we we can talk about the uh the relationship between the the west and the east as the center and the periphery but uh if we look more closely into the asian context then then there should be Another, I mean, another level of, uh, or much more other levels of the center and periphery. So, um, so the second phase uh, is the discussion about the the this discussion about the relationship between the history of Chinese STM and the history of East Asian STM, and of course, the, uh, there are uh, many more the similar cases and similar discussions about the relationship between the regional center and the regional periphery regional quasi centers and the even in the periphery you can also find so, some even more uh i mean even further uh separation between the uh, center and the periphery uh, actually that question is recurring everywhere and and uh, when, when we talk about the every every time and place so uh, i i'd like to just quote a remark from the the late professor nakayama shigeru uh, which was published in 1995 that he uh while talking about the the historical development of the history of east asian stm he mentioned that scholars at the periphery know what is going on at the center and few of the latter i mean the scholars at the cent center are interested in what's going on at the periphery so um I think basically that that criticism, uh, criticism or a uh, criticism targeted on the the scholars in the the West, the center at the time, and also he advocated the uh, the more contribution from the scholars uh, from the periphery. But uh, my point is that doesn't this the same doesn't the same doesn't this apply to the the another context inside the East Asia. So, I mean, uh, I'm actually, uh, of course I'm talking about this because I'm from Korea and uh, I'd like to, uh, I mean, I'd like to just tell you that actually uh, most of the Korean scholars in the history of STM have uh, thought about this again and again. And, and also we, we also want to uh, make more plausible strategies for the, uh, for writing history of STM from the periphery of the periphery. And as I mentioned, that, that question is recurring on every level. So even within Korea, you can talk about the tension between the Seoul and Jeju Island, for example. And if you talk about Japan, you can talk about the, the uh, tension between the Tokyo and Hokkaido, Tokyo and Sapporo, Hokkaido, and also in China as well. So uh, Beijing and Nanjing and also Kunming. So uh, so then, then uh, rather than just... Um, rather than just mentioning or uh, re, re uh, highlighting this question again and again what should they do what should they do in practice um so uh, actually as i told you many korean scholars try to answer respond to this question and one early attempt uh, not, not not quite early in to, because uh, that remark was actually made in 2004, but uh, uh, Professor Chen Sangwon, late Professor Chen Sangwon, was the the early generation. He was he belonged to an early generation of the historians of science and uh, technology in Korea. Uh, he uh, so uh, in his late years, um, uh, Professor Chen Sangwon uh, uh, suggested an uh, suggested a claim that 
actually the the Korea in the in the early 15th century the the early chose in the early chosen period was actually leading the development of science and technology medicine in the world and his proof his evidence is that he actually counted the numbers of the entries in the Japanese one of one of Japanese encyclopedia of the history of science, uh, which covers from 1400 to 1450. And he, um, after looking through that, uh, that record, he claimed that the Korea was, I mean, the contribution from Korea was mentioned 29 times, while China was mentioned five times and no mention about Japan. And the, uh, when he combined the, all the entries uh, from the uh, outside East Asia, it is only 28. So uh, that was, I mean, uh, uh, that, of course, that is more like an episodic. Um, and and he, he just... Uh, so this is not a, the the argument of a big volume of books, but uh, that's just one, one hint he he provided. But uh, it it also shows uh, what kind of approach uh, Korean scholars try to take. Uh, so um, I I don't want to talk uh, go deep into the how can I say the validity of this argument, and I I'm not sure whether you might agree. Uh, to him or not but uh, what i what i want to um, point out is that although this kind of approach is very interesting we we should also think about uh whether we can apply this approach to any time anywhere in the history of stm in the world so um i mean uh we cannot be leaders uh, all, the, all the times. We cannot be the innovators all the times. So there could be some period of time. There could be some, some places uh, where we can be very innovative and you can be even leading the development uh, in, in the whole world. But that doesn't happen every day. So uh, this kind, I mean, so, so could this kind of approach be uh, applicable to other times and place, to, and and uh, if not, then what should our what should our approach uh, be like? So, um, actually, there are some some uh, some younger generation scholar in in Korea uh, who who believe that uh, rather we we we'd better talk about the civilization itself civilization korean civilization itself which has its own uh, raison d'etre and uh and and we we should talk about science technology medicine within the context of the civilization because all each every civilization has its own narrative and and they they uh uh, we have to respect all every civilization, whether they uh, left something, I mean, left some remarkable contribution to the, the, the history of world science or not. So I mean, but uh, if we if we keep talking about the science and they maybe we if we stick to the idea of science because uh, you know the 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 word sometimes the uh, the uh, restrict our thinking so uh, we we might be uh, also. Uh, we might be also stuck to these ideas of a novelty, innovation, or achievement. So, um, so that's why. Actually, uh, that's that's why uh, the scholars in Cheonbuk National University uh, decided to launch a quite a big project. Uh, the the uh, basically it's a book project, the science and civilization in Korea. You know, the title is quite familiar in some way because it's an actually direct homage to the science and civilization in China. Although we use Z instead of S in civilization, but anyway. Uh, so uh, the 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 book project began in in 2011 and it was it, su it was successfully over in 2022 by publishing 30 volumes and actually we are uh, working on the second phase uh, during which 
we should publish seven English volumes in collaboration with the Cambridge University Press. Uh, actually, uh, they are in pipeline. So probably very soon you might see the, the English volumes as well. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there is not enough time to introduce each volumes and you know they are they are written in korean but if you can uh in case you can you can read koreans actually uh, uh those books are available online i mean the ebook e version is also available so let me just let me just very briefly touch uh, what what they were talking about so there are uh 15 books dedicated to pre-modern topics while 11 books are dedicated to modern topics and you know the other uh, four titles covers the the entire peer, uh, history of korea uh, on various topics so uh we cover a lot of different topics but uh basically what we we want to i mean the 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 theme the motto we wanted to share with the 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 authors of the uh authors of uh, 30 volume is that the uh, while talking about the pre-modern period we wanted to uh, highlight the commonalities and local differences so uh, Korea was uh, a part of the East Asian civilization but also uh, wanted to uh, uh, forge their identity and and maintain it and uh, in in the okay uh, okay and the uh, while dealing with modern topics, we also uh, touch the issues of reception, catching up, and internalization. But uh, our one of our hidden agenda is that we wanted to bridge the gap. So uh, you know, in uh, outside the the Europe and in North America, uh, when we talk about the history of science, we always had to think about have to think about the 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 gap of rupture in the historiography between the, the pre-modern and modern times and uh we believe that they actually the approach the civilization approach might be one of the 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 bypass or the uh not, not maybe not answer but bypass to the that kind of tricky questions because um the those civilization uh we, we approach in terms of the civilization we can we can see more continuity than discontinuity although the language of science changed a lot the world view changed but uh, there are some some other aspect that that is that, that is uh continued for example the attitude about learning or the the social culture of the learning and books okay so um this is just an, a very brief outline about the or the uh, introduction of our book project and okay now is the time to end thank you so much thank you very much kim and now we will hear professor xiao shun he also has some um, slides that he will share. Okay. Uh, we cannot hear you. You have to unmute. Now, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Marcus, for in introducing. It's uh, it's my uh, great honor to be here to participate in this uh, DHST uh, Global History of Science and Technology Festival. I'm uh, recommended by Chinese Society for the History of Science. It's a big honor. Uh, I just uh, today actually is uh, is a uh, Middle Autumn Festival. So I wish all of you. Uh, 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 a, a good day and uh, a full moon yeah in, in, uh, it's a very, which means uh, perfect in life yeah uh, happiness in life and i will just come to my uh, topic I, I i this is a big topic i think yeah uh, does the chinese past have a future i'm talking about the chinese sciences developing new narratives in the history of chinese science and technology uh 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 According to, I, I, I would, not, would like to mention that uh, uh, Karl Jaspers, a German uh, philosopher and a historian, he says uh, in his The Origin and the Global Goal of History, the past, the present, and the future are connected. The 5,000 years of human history 
is open towards a prehistory as well as towards the future. It cannot be limited in either directions. And the present reaches uh, full fulfillment through the historical ground, which we bring to effective activity within ourselves. And the present uh, reaches fulfillment, fulfillment, fulfillment through the future latent within it. So in China, you know, every nation, of course, constructs uh, uh, historical narratives and myths to frame its goals and aspirations for for the uh, for the future. And nowadays, we're talking about the rejuvenization of the Chinese uh, culture and the nation, and uh, we are encountering, you know, unprecedented transformation, global transformations. So in this era. Chinese, this thinking about the Chinese past and its relation to future is particularly uh, relevant. China's rich history of science and technology serves as cultural foundation for guiding the nation's future innovations in, in the field. I think uh, the Chinese were particularly efficient in uh, applying knowledge about nature to practical ends most importantly to the governance of a state. So in our time when science hold a dominant role in society, the Chinese past experiences and practices can be useful for building a healthy relationship between science and, tech, uh, science and society. Uh, this will make historical studies in science and culture, science and society, science and politics, science and individual consciousness in China relevant to the future of science in the world. Professor Kim just uh, mentioned uh, Joseph Needham, everybody who studied science, history of science in China or in East Asia, we, we, we always, uh, yeah, we, we cannot forget the contribution of uh, Joseph Needham. Uh, uh, the traditional narrative surrounding the history of Chinese science, which is often revolves around the Needham question. But this question, although it's contributed to for the West uh, to understand, to, to, to say China ha had had a science, but failed to capture the true essence of Chinese scientific thought and practice. These narratives, uh, just as um, uh, Professor King mentioned, is, are relatively re inherently Eurocentric and uh, rely on questionable assumptions about a science, such as the idea of the scientific revolution was inevitable global event, or that science is universal, objective, and value-free. So about this, Eurocentric has a long history. We can go back to uh, Hegel, to Rank. I'm not going to dwell on this, but I just mentioned, for example, Hegel's lesson of philosophy that is the Greek. Everything starts from the Greek. All of our science and art which adorns and dignifies spiritual life, has earlier emanated directly from Greece or come from us, uh, from Greece, in a roundabout way, via the Romans. So Hegel more or less excluded the non-Western world from the world history. Uh, particularly, he mentioned, I think, uh, the, uh, uh, Siberia, for example, uh, uh, that's uh, something uh, 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 the Russian, you know, writer uh, Tostoevsky also complained about. He he eliminated the Siberia from the from the world history. Also, Asia and of course Africa. Africa does not deserve a part to be a part. Asia does not deserve to be a part of history. So, all this. Uh, 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 West Eurocentrism is the views that the uh, non-Western world is stagnant, empty of intellectual creativity and uh, spiritual values. And uh, in Max Weber's words, the absence of uh, uh, rationality. So basically, West gives civilization and the East receives civilization. If something East do not uh, have science, uh, scientific revolution, it must be something went wrong with the East, East or Chinese society. So I think this J.M. Broad uh, in the colonizer model for the world, he he meant, he just just posed, compared the Western and the non-Western. Basically, Western rationality invents and uh, the non-Western is 
imitations, imitating irrationality, etc. Uh, progress and uh, uh, stagnation. But of course, about this West Central, the many criticism uh, from historians, economic history, and also uh, historians in the his history of science. I may just mention some uh, Emmanuel Wallenstein, uh, he also I think participated in the Needham project, Frank, and also a world historian, uh, uh, William McNair, et cetera. And in that we know people like, uh, of course, Francesca Bray, and Timothy Brook and Bing Wong and uh, Kenneth Pomeran also uh, wrote uh, either uh, economic history or uh, history of science or world history, uh, criticizing, uh, rethinking about this uh, world history. Should think in the uh, world system, system, thinking about world systems, not just uh, Western uh, uh, centered, Euro centered uh, his history. I come to realize that uh, when I read this uh, Levi Strauss, The Savage Mind, he mentioned this uh, neolithic paradox. He mentioned the, the invention of agriculture, pottery, weaving, and the domestication of animals. That is a kind of a neolithic revolution. But between this neolithic revolution and the scientific revolution in the 17th century, there's a long period of several thousand years. Is this is a long stand still of uh, civilization? What China had achieved on this long platform between these two essence of the levels of, of civilizations. So no, the question is now it comes to about the concept of science. Of course, uh, when we have the accumulate develop, as Kuhn said, development by accumulation model, of course, then your clinical scientific discoveries and events, and you find inhibitor factors, where factors, obstacles, which inhibit uh, the uh, logical or necessary uh, development of science. I think that's not the picture or should not be the picture of a world, world history of science. But uh, about the Chinese science, there was even, uh, I think, particularly in China, I think, uh, uh, Chinese scholars have some many misconceptions about the Chinese science. First, the no science, no spirit of seeking truth, no experiment, no mathematics, and a numerical system is a mysterism, which is uh, superstitious, uh, and also some book of changes inhibited of science, bureaucratic, and Asian mode of production. Many explanations to to explain why science modern science did not uh, develop occur in, in China. So I, I think to establish a modern scientific culture in country with a profound national history of China, we have to examine what do in this respect, perhaps, yeah, the idea of a unity of heaven and a man universal schema and a scientific argumentation. I have to go very quickly and it, I will come to think, talk about just about the scientific observation and experimentation and probably digital cosmological models. For, for observations and classification, for example, if from the hand time, the, the observation of the comet that described 29 types of comets I depicted. I depict. And a lot for logical reasoning, if you come to, to read Liu Hui's mathematical work, you can see that the same logic, uh, like Aristotelian syllogism, can be found in the mathematical thinking. I think uh, Garin Shemla and uh, Gu Shu Chen had uh, uh, done studies on this. For experiment, uh, uh, this is in Mots, uh, it's a pinhole camera experiment. It's not just an observation of a phenomena, but it's a way, it's experiment to demonstrate the straight propagation of light. Also, you can see in alchemical text, you can see all these vessels. It's very much like an alchemical uh, a, a chemical laboratory. Uh, China is, was very famous for porcelain making. Uh, yeah. How can they achieve such a high, high technology, high skill? I went to Jingdezheng and see all these samples. It's not just a fragment. It's samples for to, with different materials, different uh, paint, and also names. They are burned. Uh, in the kiln and to see what is effect. So that's uh, that's experimental samples in the production of a porcelain in Jindazhen. Also in China, 
you have some sort of experiment, for example, exploring the nature of chi, the cosmic chi. It's very much similar to the to the expert Michaels and Morey experiment about the ether. Yeah. So you have a theory. You you have some uh, uh, some uh, some. Then you have some imagination. You think about how to do it. The Chinese how to measure the twenty four new uh, solar terms. The spring, the winter solstice. When the chi comes, it should vibrate with the cosmic chi, and. That, uh, I'm also talking about the Chinese current uh, uh, astronomic system. The Chinese current is not just the arrangement of dates, but as a way to, to it's calculate everything of celestial phenomena, also social human phenomena. But uh, you, if we uh, study the current, you can see these uh, these uh, three constant systems: concordance, the sequence is five paces for five planets. And then the manipulative technique, mathematical tech to do the computations. We can, uh, Christopher Curlin had a very excellent uh, researches on this. Uh, but you see this astronomical constant, you see, you can see they're not directly measured. They are construction. So these constructions must have some theories. It's a theory embedded. It has to have some uh, uh, philosophical background. So it's not just a measurement of a measuring and you, did, you, you, you have the constant. Uh, so it's a construction. So, so the, how do these do this? It's a very similar to, uh, to uh, Greek Plato. I, I just want to uh, compare it with Plato. Plato, of course, consider every natural substance to be compound of four simple bodies. And all these are come from very simple, you know, these, uh, these, uh, these shapes that, the right angled iso isocyclus or the half equatorius. The Chinese do not use shape, but they use numbers. So astronomical constant are derived from cosmic numbers. The Chinese called He Tu and Luo Su. Basically, it's heavenly numbers from one to ten, and those uh, odd numbers, the heavenly numbers, and the even numbers. So in this way, they they construct and also use the Yi Jing. This uh, uh, this uh, numerology to construct these numbers in this way that can produce a model for calculating everything you know uh, solar motions lunar motions and uh, and the planetary motions so for the planetary motion i just show this development from the first century the triple concordance uh, calendar you see this green line and the blue line the green line is the giving in the in the calendar the blue line is a real actual uh, movement so it fits not so well, but it's quite okay. But when you come to hand to the uh, later hand to the uh, to the these calendars, you can see all the development. First, it, the I, I, I'm sorry, Shashum. Yeah. Could you yes. please wrap it up in? A couple okay. Of minutes? Very good. So I'm sorry. the Chinese use numerical knowledge, but uh, the Greeks use these epicycles. Yeah. So I and the Chinese also, you know, you see. Uh, from the 11, 11th century, also for, for computation of Martian motions, you can achieve the, the same level as the, uh, using Copernicus theory in the 16th century. So, so we have to have a new, a new understanding of the Chinese science. And then we can have some big pictures, I would think about the situated Chinese past in the uh, world history. And also we can think about the heaven man oath relationship and uh, for this, I can I can mention just one book: uh, the Sterox animals and uh, the demons in early Ch early China. Think about the human and animal relationships. We can also think about the body, sentience, and the future of Chinese medicine, because always all, all these new in artificial intelligence brain, brain brain computer interfaces, we can think about what's the boundary between man and the, and the machine, and of course we can also think about environment, climate, and change for the good life. So finally, just to say, I conclusion, China's rich scientific past offered a unique source for aspiration and guidance for the future of science and technology. And when China, uh, by developing new narratives that encompass the holistic and environmental conscious aspects of traditional Chinese thought, we can navigate the challenges, opportunities of the 21st century more effectively and sustainably. Ultimately, the Chinese past has a future when that can shape the course of a global science and a technology for years to come. Thank you for listening.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sam, if I'm not mistaken, we don't have questions, right? We, we don't because something going on wrong with the Zoom. But if there's okay. anyone out there in the audience okay. who or, or, raises or, their or, hand, I can unmute or, them. Otherwise, since we have five minutes, I will make a final comment and we end, end the session. Um, I will make it in the form of questions. I think that the three interventions are very interesting to think about what is going on in history of science. Uh, Pablo make a thing that we probably lost our original connection to philosophy of science. And probably um, many historians of science, including myself, have been moving towards the social sciences and other fields and that we should return to the origins of the discipline where we were brothers as we are in the division of history of science with the other division of philosophy of science. So that is a question that we should probably make in the future. What is the exact um, interaction between history and philosophy of science? And the two other papers, very remarkable. I think that they have in common the idea of decentering history of science uh, the need of the center in history of science that has been going on for some years, and Professor Shashum has made some remarkable work in this direction. And I raise as questions, not to be responded today, but uh, I appreciate very much, for example, the proposal of Kim on civilizations. But should we still use the word periphery? After all you said about Korean science, I don't think that is peripheral at all or Chinese eyes, that don't, doesn't seem peripheral at all, no? And also, should we do a more comparative history? Maybe that is a, a good perspective, a good methodology, as Professor Zhang Shun has suggested, but I'm going to uh, provoke with another question. About, what about doing a global history of science from the global south? from China or from Argentina or from Korea. Know that we, what some historians have been calling in other, in other fields, provincialize Europe or to place Europe in balance with the other parts of the world where the majority of population live and had a need of knowledge, of innovation, of science, of technology, no? Now, well, thank you very much. And sorry for stopping here. Uh, we appreciate very much your participation. And now we'll turn to Tomas that will guide us on how to move to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah. Thank Goodbye. you so much, Thank you. Marcus and colleagues. Uh, okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you 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 are thank you everybody uh all thanks to all the speakers and uh, uh many participants we have here i'm sorry for the problem we had with the q a box in this session this has already been sorted out and uh we can move on to session number two this one is gonna be uh, uh taken down and people who want to join us on session two, you just go to the same page where you joined this one and click uh, on the second one. Okay, so thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we thank have you, to exit Thomas. this session. This is gonna uh, uh, disappear okay. by okay. itself. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Okay.